The cultural districts of Minneapolis revel in the motto of every neighborhood having its own flavor. Whether that's Sabor Latino in Holy Land over in Northeast Minneapolis on Central Avenue, Barakala Restaurant and the Cedar Cultural Center over in the Cedar Riverside neighborhood, or even Mercado Central in Los Ocampo over on Lake Street. And these cultural districts help Minneapolis stay a city on the bubble, changing and relevant today and for years to come. It's not just another day in your life. Things are changing for the better. At Comcast, we see those changes and we're thinking about how we use technology today to live, work, learn, and play. And we're building for the future now, so we're better prepared for the wants and needs of tomorrow. That's why Comcast is rolling out multi-gig internet speeds to more than 50 million homes and businesses before the end of 2025, making our already industry-leading network even faster, smarter, greener, and more reliable. Over the decades, Comcast has been your partner, working hard to serve your community, and will continue to be your partner. We're expanding our gigabits so you can enjoy the tiny bits that matter most. Hey, welcome back. Welcome to the Financially Fit Podcast. I am your host, Andre Creighton. For those of you that are new, welcome to the podcast. I look forward to having you here today. Uh, and for those returning, thank you for rocking with me again. I'm glad that you feel that I'm giving you some type of content that's helpful in your life or someone that you know. Um, as, I, as I've always stated, that everything that I talk about in this podcast is from my personal perspective. Um, I am not a financial advisor, but I, I am a CFO of a company and I do have a pretty extensive background in uh, dealing with finance from business to personal. Um, so everything is is from my perspective and you can take that with a grain of salt. Um, so um, today, uh, what I'm talking about today, today is the first part of a six part series. So um, we are going to talk about what you should be doing in your 20s. Um, uh, following this podcast um next week we'll start to talk about your 30s 40s 50s and 60s and so on but today we're focusing on uh those in their 20s that are new to you know a career or just finishing college or maybe they're you know jump straight into the workforce after high school what are the things you should be doing in your 20s to set yourself up for success because i believe that everyone has a goal that they want to retire at some point and be able to enjoy the fruits of their labor and uh, and spend time with their, their kids or grandkids or whatever it may be and travel, spend time with their significant other. And I think, you know, I'm hoping that what I give you today gives you some perspective as to what you should be doing in your 20s to help you um, kind of right the ship and be on that pathway to uh, uh, retirement. So um, as always, I always like to start with stories because I think it's just relatable for people to hear my perspective and the things that I've done, you know, now being a 32 year old, uh, I'm well past my twenties. Uh, but it, it, I think just hearing some of the things that I did in my twenties and, and what kind of has propelled me to this point um, is very helpful. So, you know, uh, as I was, uh, for those that don't know, I, you know, obviously graduated high school and I went on to a private college, played some football and basketball down there in college. Um, basketball only played for a year um, before I, I realized that I was going to be a bench warmer. So I decided that uh, I was just going to focus my attentions on, on, on football. Um, but following, you know, graduating college, I jumped right into the workforce and I was working as a tax accountant um, at a local law uh, CPA firm. And what I found about my trajectory that's gotten me to the CFO role now and being an entrepreneur was, you know, those those hours that when I was working, you know, 80, 90 hours a week during busy season, during tax season to working on, you know, corporation tax, uh, 
S Corp partnerships, um, nonprofits, estate and trusts, high net worth individuals, you name it. Um, I wanted to get a, become well-rounded in that atmosphere so I could have more opportunities later in my career as I kind of figured out what I wanted to do. Um, but I, you know, as I said, I was working 80, 90 hours a week. And, you know, when you're a salaried employee, you're not getting paid for those additional hours you're, you're, you're working, but what you are getting is you're getting the knowledge, right? Um, so what I didn't know is I was, and I, I think I just unconsciously was doing this was I was investing in myself, right? I was investing in myself because I knew that, you know, I didn't want to be a staff accountant forever, but I didn't quite know what I wanted to do. So fast forward, I'm there for two and a half years, decide that, okay, um, I gained a foundation in tax. And I was like, all right, well, I kind of really like the C-Corp and working with large corporations. So then I, I I found a role with Baker Tilly, a more multinational, larger firm, uh, and, and entered into their tax department, working with more larger corporations. And what that did was it really kind of set me on this trajectory to really be able to understand the intricate pieces around how big corps operate um, and how do they sustain financial um, health and, and how do they sustain their profitability and all those things, all those aspects that helped me get to this point as a CFO. Later after that, I, I, I left and I went on to Cargill and I was working in Cargill's corporate uh, tax strategy department for about three years. Um, and this was more, you know, now I'm working at a big, big private company, one of the largest in the world, um, you know, 150 subsidiaries, $3 billion in, in, in taxable income, uh, really, really large company, right? And I was only a piece of the department, a piece of that, that um, what was driving the tax strategy and things within that department. But what I learned was that job really helped kind of propel me to where I am now because it forced me to say like, yeah, I don't think tax is for me. I've kind of done the discovery around all these different things and I've been in tax for five, six years. So I went back, got my MBA in finance um, to hopefully be more well-rounded and not so niche in just the tax atmosphere. <laughs> Uh, and then launched after finishing my MBA, my career at Spire Credit Union, a financial institution here in Minnesota, helping them build out their finance department before uh, inevitably uh, me and two of my buddies, Jazz and Michael, quit our jobs in the middle of the pandemic and launched Turn Signal. Um, all that to say, there's five things I want to touch on that I think really, really, if you can do in your 20s, will set you apart um, from, from the average 20 year old and really help you down that retirement path. So number one, and I kind of discussed this just a, a second ago is invest in yourself. Um, whatever it may be, whatever career you go into or, um, field that you decide, uh, makes sense for you, you know, find certifications that you can get within said field. Um, go back to school and get an MBA or go back to school and, uh, get a graduate degree of uh, some higher level. What I found was, as I was kind of looking for some of those higher positions, manager roles, director roles, um, that kind of align with the years of experience that I had, I was finding that a lot of them said, you know, uh, MBA required or MBA uh, preferred or CPA required or CPA preferred. Uh, and I just got sick of seeing MBA preferred and knowing that there could be someone out there um, that's applying for the same job that has their MBA, and I'm not even in the in the arena anymore, right? Because I don't have that. So uh, that's what really pushed me to go back. So whatever you do, invest in yourself, because those are the things as you get into your 30s and 40s, um, those are the things that are going to help you escalate your income, right? That are going to help you get to that higher income threshold that's going to help you get to hopefully retirement quicker because you're doing a lot of the other things that we we, we talk about on a granular level um, with, within our podcast. Uh, number two is establish reasonable credit. So my first credit card, uh, I had a small credit card. I think it was like $500. And I believe it was a Discover It card uh, was my first kind of run in with a credit card. 
And, you know, I think that really what you should do at some point, you have to have some type of credit. You have to have the ability to establish that. And in order to establish that, you need to have, you know, some type of credit card or loan or whether it's student loans or something like that. So um, what I do encourage people is to take out a modest amount, right? Take out a modest credit card that you know is comfortable, that you have enough money every paycheck where you could say, hey, I'm going to pay this off. Even if I were to max this out, I have the ability to pay this off right away. Um, I, I think that that would be very helpful in helping you establish your credit. You know, obviously we're targeting a, a, a credit score of 700 or above. Um, that's that's kind of our target. You know, obviously 750 is more ideal. And the reasons why, you know, that 700 is, is kind of where you want to look because it's going to give you more options from an interest standpoint that's going to hopefully help you save money over time. Uh, the next one is avoid consumer debt in general. So um, I know I just mentioned, you know, establishing credit and, and taking out a modest amount. You do still want to be able to avoid, you know, consumer debt as much as possible. Um, if you have cash to pay for things, pay for it with cash, right? Um, until you feel comfortable about your strategies to be able to pay off your, your credit cards on a month-to-month -month basis and not keeping a balance rolling on there. Um, so that's up to you. But that, that I would encourage you to, you know, really stay away from that consumer debt if you if you can. I know sometimes things come up and it's unavoidable. Um, but it, you know, in the event that you do decide to go down the consumer debt route, whether it's a credit card, you know, look for those some of those cards that have you know lower interest rates. You know, anything over, I would say, fifteen percent or so is 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 really high, and even fifteen percent is high. Um, I would also say to look for something where, you know, there's many cars that have like you go um, and, and you buy something and you get 18 months, zero interest. Like, like those are the ones that I would say you target because that gives you the, the ability to pay it off over time over 18 months span without any interest accruing. Now, the caveat to those are you do want to make sure you pay that off by month 18 because many of those have a catch where. If you don't pay it off by then, uh, you will you will have to you will accrue the interest, and now that interest will become a part of your principal. Uh, and many times, those are very very unfavorable interest rate terms. So, um, be very cognizant of that. And and I think you know those are the things that help set you on the right track um, as far as establishing reasonable credit and 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 trying to avoid uh, getting yourself down this domino effect of being in credit card debt. Uh, number four. Uh, start an emergency fund, you know, whether it's $25 or $10 or whatever it may be, you know, you want to be contributing something to an emergency fund every single paycheck. Um, and obviously, as you continue to earn more income and you have more surplus, then you can start to delegate more uh, or allocate more, sorry, um, to that to those uh, to that savings fund. Um to make sure that you don't have to use consumer debt uh, later down the line because you will have an emergency fund. So um, the, the biggest thing is a lot of people get into this uh, perspective that, you know, well, I can't put 200, 300, 400 dollars into an emergency fund every check, so I'm just not going to do it. And what I will tell you is the importance is starting somewhere, right? Um, there's a there's an old adage that says it's not about how you start, it's about how you finish, right? Um, it's it's not a sprint, it's a marathon, right? It's the same thing with working on you know your finances. It's a lifetime marathon, right? Um, it's not a sprint. It's not going to happen overnight. The last one is begin saving for retirement, and this is the hardest one I think for twenty year olds to um, come to terms with, right? Because you're twenty. You know, for the most part, most people don't retire to their 60, 65. And, you know, when you're 20 years old or in your 20s, you know, that's 40 years from now, right? And you can't, you can't see that in that moment, right? I know for me, I had a hard time um, putting money to retirement early on in my career. As a matter of fact, I don't even think that I was in my first job at Lurie um, that I was actually contributing to my retirement. I don't think it was until I got to Baker Tilly. And at that point I was 25 that I said, all right, 
I've been in a career for three years. I'm halfway to 30. Um, what am I going to do uh, now to make sure that I'm set up better in my 30s than I am in my 20s? And that's when I started my retirement fund. Uh, and, and I started out very modest. I think I started out with like $100 a check. Um, and I eventually ramped it up. Uh, one thing that I did do that helped a ton, and I learned this from my financial advisor, which if you listen to any of my prior ones, I talked about why you should have a financial advisor. If you haven't, please check that out. Um, my financial advisor had a really, really great point that really was kind of like a re- eureka moment for me. Um, you know, he had mentioned that Every year, you if you're working hard, you usually get you know three, four, or five percent raise, right? And he mentioned that you know as you're contributing to your retirement, just increase it by one percent, right? You're not even going to see that. You're not even going to notice the difference because at the end of the day, if you've just gotten three, four percent increase in your pay, uh, and you're contributing an extra one percent to your retirement, you're still going to be making more money than you were last year. Um, so that really has helped me because um, it's really been an out of sight, um, out of sight, out of mind type of um, mindset that has kind of helped me with my retirement because it, it is hard, right? It's it's hard when you're 20, 30 years old to think about what you want life to look like when you're 60, 65, but it's so important. Uh, otherwise, you'll be working until you're 70, 80 years old and never get to rest. Um, and and really enjoy the fruits of your labor of all those years of working. So hopefully, you know, those are the five things that I think are are very important. Once again, invest in yourself, establish reasonable credit, avoid consumer debt, start an emergency fund, begin saving for retirement. Those are the five things that if you can do those things in your 20s, you're going to be on a really, really good trajectory to making sure that you are financially fit. So as I always say, it's not about how much money you make, it's about how much money you keep. So please, please make sure that you think about these things as you continue down your financial journey. Once again, I'm your host, Andre Creighton, and thank you once again for tuning in with me, and I'll see you again next week. Later. Hi, I'm Shaletta Brundage. I'm a media personality, podcaster, and a business owner. But my most important role is mom. Three of my beautiful kids have been diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. When I didn't know who to trust or where to turn, I found ACRA. ACRA provides home care services to families all over Minnesota. The care is not one size fits all. They know each one of my kids is unique. They listen to what resources we needed and what's best for our family. I've seen my kids grow and thrive with ACRA's in-home care. While autism is the most common diagnosis among ACRA clients, ACRA offers personalized in-home care services for people with disabilities, chronic illnesses, behavioral diagnosis, and mental illness. They work with children, adolescents, and older folks too. Find out more about ACRA at their website, acrahomecare.org. ACRA helps me provide my kids with a better quality of life. They can do it for your family, too. Children's Minnesota, the leader in specialized health care for kids, is here to raise awareness, standards, the bar, the stakes, the question, the curtain. On raising kids' health to the highest priority, Kids need equal access to health care, more pediatric expertise, a voice for change. Kids need us, all of us. So let's raise them up. Children's Minnesota, the kid experts. Do you worry that lead-based pain in your older home might be dangerous to your children or kids who visit you? Well, Hennepin County put those fears to rest. Hennepin County offers free lead tests and home assessments. If they find anything, eligible homeowners and landlords can receive up to $15,000 for work on the home, including new windows. 
The government banned lead-based paint 45 years ago when it was discovered that lead poisoning can affect development and cause permanent damage in young children. But 75% of those homes built before 1978 still contain some lead-based paint. As the paint degrades, it can make dust that little kids ingest when they're crawling and putting things in their mouths. So make sure your home is safe and hazard-free. Learn about testing and that $15,000 grant at hennepin.us backslash lead control. That's hennepin.us backslash lead control. COVID-19 is still going around, and even a mild case can be serious during pregnancy. So what should you do if you're pregnant and have a positive COVID test? First, reach out to your doctor or healthcare provider. There might be treatment options they can recommend. That includes giving you a prescription for an antiviral drug you take in pill form by mouth. If you haven't gotten a COVID vaccine, it's not too late. Doctors say vaccinations are safe in any trimester but the sooner the better. Pregnancy can be a time of great joy and anticipation. So take good care so you and your baby are healthy. And congratulations. You know Shaletta makes you laugh, but did you know Shaletta Brundage can also make you think and boost your business? Media personality, activist, and comedian Shaletta Brundage founded Shaletta Makes Me Laugh to celebrate and share the best of black culture. It's a podcasting platform. You can download 10 weekly podcasts hosted by African-American subject experts at ShalettaMakesMeLaugh.com or wherever you find your favorite podcasts. ShalettaMakesMeLaugh.com is also a production house creating broadcast quality commercial content. And Shaletta and her team of storytellers create powerful promotional campaigns to get businesses the brand awareness they're looking for. Some of Minnesota's top businesses trust Shaletta, and you can too. Get out the word about your events and products and get in front of communities of color with ShalettaMakesMeLaugh.com. She's got the power to help your business.